Well, I was just going to take care of everything from the floor, but it kind of occurred to me they can't see me on the camera. Them folks at home need to see me, I reckon, don't you, don't you think? And uh, so when I'm down there on the floor, uh, so we, we need to read our names off. Brother Rodney called. He meant to be here, but he's sick. He thought he might have ate something today that gave him a, an upset stomach, and so he's not feeling well. And uh, we talked to the pastor today, and uh, actually through text, but he, uh, he let me know he really appreciated all the, uh, all the calls and all the ones that had been in contact with him, and he knows we're praying for them. He said, Miss Debbie might be just a little bit better. Uh, it's, uh, it's going slow, and he understands it's going to take some time. He's just anxious, of course, for her to, to be doing better. So let's don't forget to, to pray for them. Keep her in your prayers. Uh, that the Lord just help her to get her strength back and get over this situation. But anyway, and pray for him. Uh, he's hoping, uh, and I, I told him, Brother Jay had just done us a real good job, and it had been a, a joy to have him. Uh, but he's hoping to be back Sunday if nothing happens between now and then to keep that from happening. He'll certainly be letting us know. But you uh, you keep them in your prayers and uh, we've got a lot of folks on our prayer list tonight that we will uh, go over. Um, uh, pastor's wife was telling me that she had talked with Karen. Karen had a, a procedure done, and uh, she's uh, she's waiting on to see uh, what the results of that is. So you keep her in your prayers. Uh, she's worried about this situation. We've got we've got a lot of folks that have had tests here of late, and. People are still waiting on getting word from things. I, I had a visit with my heart doctor yesterday, and uh, he gave me good news. Uh, all of my tests were okay, and and uh, he doesn't seem to be concerned about anything, at least today. <laughs> things changed, don't they? Uh, but anyway, I it was good news for me, and I appreciate uh, everybody's prayers. We've. Uh, We've uh, had a lot to, to go through and whatever, but a lot of people have, and uh, we certainly have got to, uh, a lot to pray for. And uh, so we'll do that and go over these names in just a minute. But uh, again, we, we appreciate you being here. Just ask that you pray for Brother Jay as he comes in a few minutes. And then, of course, pray for Sunday, if it's Lord's Day comes around again, that uh, we'll be able to be here. Uh, let's go over the names, and we'll take any any requests that y'all might have. Let's read the names off tonight. Um, Sharon Long, Martha Brown, Brantley Darnell, Paul Darnell, Omi Darnell, a special friend, Jerry Sparks, Tom Bird and family, Ernie Bird, Ann Reagan and family, Titus Bird and family, Larry and Judy Grindstaff, Kathy and Billy Ray, Buck and Marcia Shaw, Richard and Marion Fox, Larry and Jill Car Carvin, uh, Cavan, uh, missionaries, Kenneth and Peggy, Denise Goodwin, Alan Goodwin, Brenda Maupin, Jean Maupin, Wade Atkins, Heather Hughes, Chesney and Kelsey Hughes, Dalton Burney, Justin and Grayson Wilcox, Jessica and Taylor Harris, Beth and Keith Hulse, Olivia and Peyton Hulse, Jacob Murr, Madison and Kennedy French, Jacob and Lincoln Schaefer, uh, Michelle Simpson, David Rittenauer, Jonathan and Kelly Tipton, uh, Alvary, Ava, Austin, Ann, Taylor and Maddie Allman, Sandy Slark, Kathy McCoy, Randy Cloyd, our care caregivers, uh, Judy Vitito, Brenda Dickey, Family Traveling, uh, Michael Hensley, uh, Russell Roberts, Bailey Roberts, uh, Wisdom, Direction, Debbie Harold, Children of Divorce, Parents of Divorce, Brenda, Will, Chad, Jason, Alice, Ukraine, Israel, Veronica, Tommy Moody, Don and Ann, USA and Troops, uh, Timmy, Ralph, Twins, Daniel Swagger, Ashley Swagger, Hudson Swagger, Jeff Toth, Peyton Toth, Vanessa Dykes, Virginia Milhorn, Mark Keyes, Bill and Jennifer Fitzgerald, David Payne, Roger Metcalf, uh, Patsy Klontz, uh, Roger, uh, that's Rodney's brother, 
Um, and like he's mentioned, he has cancer, and he's been taking uh, chemotherapy and some things, and uh, so there's a, there's a long road for him, but I uh, just thought I'd mention that. Patsy Klontz, Danny Hicks, Chris Walters, Marvin Roller, Mike Garst, uh, Charmaine Mitchell, Thelma Woods, Teresa Jones, Betty Villier, uh, Delia Garst, Connie Lewis, Isaac Cook, Jake Holder, uh, Clint Casey, Shay Holder, Dustin Lawford, uh, Lonnie Stockton, Matt Womack, Ethan Womack, Chris Crumley, Sarah and John Fagan, Mindy Fagan, Tracy Fagan, Michael and Lindsay, School Choice, Hunter Estep, Taylor Tester, Cindy Estep, Elaine Holman, uh, Kenny Garland, Shannon Tino, Josh Bowman, Brittany Silvers, David and Judy, Larry and Gail, Rosemary and, and Peggy, Alan and Jessica, Josh and Haley, Mike and Violet, Devin and Cicelyn, uh, Frank and Judy, Alan and Cindy, Jerusalem and Israel, uh, police officers, our firefighters, uh, our country, Geraldine Dye, Taylor Lloyd, Randy and Myra, Ricky and Kathy, Rick and Angie, Anita, Anthony, Ezra, Sora, Josh and Megan, grandkids, Jolene Garce, Carolyn Marie Hulse, Tristan Bales, Mike Hyatt, Renee Vest Smith family, Nancy Bible, Rick and Jamie, Jane Jackson, Tim Livingston, Brian and Whitney Jackson, Charlotte Cutshaw, Sherry Parker, Jim and Sherry Foshi, Jack, Jerry, Bryant Jones, Tanya Daniels, Shirley Rourke, Linda Vaughn, uh, Journey Davis and Justice, uh, Beverly Dalton and Kids, Mike Leonard, Ronnie and Judy Owens, they're our VBS Bible School. Don't forget to pray for that happening here in just another week or two. Um, Cortilla, uh, Emily, Rose, Bernice Williams, Kenneth and Gail and family, Melvin and Anna, Jim and Linda and family, Charles and Treva and family, uh, Tim Hyder, Lewis Carr, Betty McInturf, Aaron and Samantha and family, Zach and Crystal and family, Jason and Elizabeth and family, Mark and Kendra and family, Melissa Broyles, Allison Mango, Jason Paul, Harold McInturf and family, Alan and Cindy, Nancy McCarty, Don McCarty, Carol Parker, Teddy Parker, Joanne Hensley, Danny Francis, Ronnie Francis, Jerry Breeden, Jerry Treadway, Chelsea, Kylie, and Grace, Sean, Lindsay, and Arira, Ara, Ara, Rhonda Herman, Joe Peoples, Beverly, Broyles family, Stephen and Haley, Edward Mason, Hunter family, Mark Keys, Patsy Keys, Ed Keys, Blake and Allison and Brooks Orr, Wayne and Sandy Keys, Jonathan, Jeff, uh, Aaron, Caden and Brandon Scott, Jason and Justin Weeks, Jim and Laura Johnson, Buddy and Patricia Snyder, and Pastor and Miss Debbie. All right, any other requests we have tonight from anybody? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yeah. Very, yeah. bet it's not okay let's remember that um, special request anybody else yes ma'am
Is he related to anybody in the church? Kathy, do you know? Or? Okay. All right, let's remember this little boy she just mentioned. Anybody else? Got something that you want to... Yes, sir, Brother Allen. We'll remember you, Brother Allen. I, this as long as they don't mess with your head. Because uh, you wouldn't want no work I've done up there, right? No. You, you know, you're already on the prayer list a couple of times here before this request, right? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm just aggravating. I like to aggravate Allen, but I uh, let's remember him in, in your prayers. Yes. Anybody else? You know, it don't matter what you go to the hospital for anymore some of the smallest of things but going to the hospital is scary it's just you know things happen up there you get stuff up there it seems like to me a lot of times you don't get better from stuff you get worse with stuff but anyway let's remember brother Allen anybody else before we pray yes ma'am Let's remember that. Let's remember that. My fall Sunday was not all my fault. I was told. Yesterday, I talked with my prosthetic people, and he said, Well, Steve, he said, It's time for you to get a refitting. He said, Your stump's smaller. He said, That's what happened. He said, Your your leg gives. And he said, from what you say, and that probably wasn't your fault at all. I said, gosh, I'm going to tell my church that because all I'm thinking I'm a, a you know, doofus. <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're going to get a readjustment, right? <laughs> got to get, get a readjustment for that. So. All right, if nobody else has got anything, let's again pray for Brother Jay tonight. Let's keep all these folks in, in your prayers, and let's pray for each other and pray for our church. And uh, just pray that the Lord will have his will. Let's bow for a minute. We'll talk to the Lord about all these names. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to come back into your house. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy. Uh, Father, we thank you for how you've blessed us in so many ways. And Lord, we come every Wednesday night, and we have a long list of names to read off of people's lives, people. Uh, having difficulties in so many different ways, sicknesses and heartache and trial and families that are in trouble and people that are facing uh, difficult times. And, uh, Lord, we just, we just pray that you could just intervene and be with these folks, Lord, all these that have been mentioned, for all of the names on our list, for every situation you only know. And, and there's so many there that we, we don't even know who they are, but we're thankful that we can read off a name. And, Lord, we know that it comes before you and, Father, we believe that you still will move and have your will and way, and that's what we pray for. Father, I just ask you to help us to be mindful every day that we need to talk to you, need to turn to you. And I thank you, Lord, for just uh, being able to pray. And Father, I just ask you to help our church be with us through these days, Lord, as we face trial and tribulation. Lord, I pray that you just be with Brother Jay as he comes and opens the word to us tonight. And Father, we pray that you just be with the pastor and Miss Debbie. God, you would touch her body. Lord, you'd heal her, Lord, if it could be your will. And we just ask, God, your will be done. And I just pray that you'd strengthen them and help them. And again, all these other folks that's been mentioned, that's been mentioned aloud to us for Lizzie and things she's going through and all these others for Brother Allen and, and just every, everybody that's been mentioned, Lord, we just pray that you'd just intervene and do what needs to be done in the lives of your people. Thank you again for all you've done for us and for what you will do. Lord, we just know that our future is in your hands. We don't know what's going to happen with this nation from one day to the next. 
But Lord, we know you're in control. I just pray that you just help us to, to look to you and believe that. Father, I pray that you just bless each one that's here tonight. Thank you again for letting us be here. Uh, be with us as we go on our way in a little while. Just ask God your will be done in our lives. For it's in Jesus' sweet and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Jay, you come on and uh, speak to us. And uh, uh, we appreciate him again for being here. And just ask that you pray for him and uh, pray for Sunday. And uh, you... Uh, It is a privilege for Linda and I to be with you from time to time. We just appreciate so much your faithfulness. Under the circumstances, it's a little difficult. We uh, keep Brother Perry and Miss Debbie in mind, and I'm sure they're plugged in tonight. We're just glad they're okay, and hope they haven't had any windstorms or hailstorms today. But thank you for being here. Every day is a new day in the world, and uh, America, uh, no exception to the rule, but the world is in convulsions in so many ways. And I am impressed by the power of the Holy Spirit as I stand with you and share with you. I'm impressed just to say this, but we want to encourage you, just encourage you in your walk with Christ and I don't know uh, how much we can go through sometimes individually and as a people, as church and so forth. But the Bible does tell us that God will not put more on us than we can bear. And he made a promise to us that he would never leave us nor forsake us. That's good news, is it not? This past Sunday night we were in uh, 1 Thessalonians and I wanted to kind of continue along. We won't go there right now, but... In your Bibles, let's turn to uh, Matthew and chapter 24. I am positive that uh, Pastor Perry has been through these scriptures over and over and over, over the years. There's not much that we can say that is new, but I promise you that all of us need to be reminded of God's plan, no matter what else is happening in the world. And don't you believe that God's plan supersedes everything else that's going on? I mean, really, there's not anything that's going to outstrip God's plan or put it on hold or slow it down. God is right on time. He's on schedule. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he knows how to fix everything when it's broken. Amen? <laughs> I don't know how many times something breaks around your house, but my stars, about every time I turn around, something broke. And we are people with needs, and so I... I tell my little wife, I say, oh, look, sweetheart, I'm your servant, and so when something breaks, you just let me know. I'll fix it. There's been times when I couldn't fix it, and so I have to call in somebody else. Life is just that way. Things break, and we need some help. There are things that only God will be able to do in your life and mine. I feel helpless at times when people share with me the burdens of their lives and needs and so forth. And so I will say, as most preachers and pastors will do, I will say, well, I will certainly pray for you. I just wish that I was able to fix the problems right on the spot and to enjoy just watching the power of God at work. Let's move in the direction of faith every day, greater faith. If we can have a little bit of faith, I think we can have a greater amount of faith. And we need to just move in that direction all the time, believing that God We'll hear the needs of our lives and we'll have mercy on us and we'll perform the miracles that we so desperately need. Chapter 24 of Matthew. And I wanted to kind of pick up on the theme of the return of Christ. Now I could talk about Jesus' return over and over uh, again and again. We, we can only talk about it so much, but I don't think we'll ever wear it out. But Jesus said, look at uh, chapter 24, look down at verse 5. I'm going to kind of skip across a few preliminary verses. He said, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, he said, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines pestilences, earthquakes 
in divers or different places. Now he said in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. It's a very important statement right there. They're the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another, shall hate one another. Now the portrait, the picture that Jesus is drawing here is dismal. He says in verse 11, Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, because iniquity shall abound and love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end the same shall be saved. And then he said in verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I'm going to hasten on just a little bit and jump down to some of the few verses that we have rehearsed over and over through the years. Uh, and this has to do with the return of Christ for the bride, the church, the body of Christ, us. We are all of the above. And so, according to verse 31, skip down to this one, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Then he says in verse 32, now learn a parable of the fig tree. Many scholars say this is where Jesus changed gears, so to speak. When his branch is yet tender, and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Now he's talking about all the things that he has described in his previous uh, 31 verses. So likewise, in verse 33, you'll know that uh, you're at the door when all these things begin to happen. I underscore the word begin. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, re referring back to verse 32, and most of you know what we'll uh, talk about what, when we mention this being the parable of the fig tree or how that Israel is the fig tree in the parable. Most scholars believe this to be true. It fits perfectly. The whole narrative makes a lot of sense when we have, uh, in this case, the uh, people of Israel. So then he said, in verse 37, let's read 36 first, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So also shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I'm going to pause right there for just a couple of moments and just simply, I guess, elaborate a little bit on the details here. In the event that Israel, uh, and this has been 2,000 years ago, but in the event that Israel becomes the focal point as we see it today, we're just reminded that Israel has only been a nation now for 75 years, from 1948 until now. And so the history of this whole thing began to unfold about 75 years ago when it was declared that Israel would become a nation and that they would have their own land back and begin to return back to that particular place on the map. And I get excited about it. Lynn and I talk about it often, but in our lifetime and yours, we have watched this prophecy unfold. Now, that's big, in my humble opinion. That's big because the world has waited 2,000 years to see this. And so here we are talking about it tonight. And I've had the privilege, some of you may, how many of you, have, any of you been to Israel? I'm curious. Well, I've had the privilege to go five times, and I don't mind telling you, friends, each time was an experience, an unforgettable experience, and I, I don't want to overdo it, but you know, when you can walk someplace where Jesus himself walks, it's special, and so all the guides take the tour people around to the very special places that, uh, of course, include where Jesus spent a lot of time. 
And as I look back, I'm just reminded of how real Israel is, how real Jerusalem is. And I've been to the Temple Mount, and it's kind of a long story, which I won't go into, but on one of my trips, I asked the tour guide if I would be able to just take the day uh, and enjoy it by myself. And uh, in this case, this was a young lady who was a tour guide, and so she said, yes, you can do that. So anyway, I spent the whole day in the old city, and believe it or not, I may have told you this, I apologize if I've repeated it before, but I shared it along the way as a testimonial, but I spent the entire day in the old city of Jerusalem, and I was on the Temple Mount, believe it or not, by myself. I've never seen uh, that in any other situation. There was nobody up there except for one older Arab guy who came up to me, and he was a little kind of a short fellow, very thin, and he said uh, in his broken English, uh, can I show you around the Temple Mount? Well, I kind of knew where I was going, and so I thanked him, and I said, well, I really appreciate your offer, uh, but I said, I'll just be here for a little while, and so I, I was. Well, he turned to leave, and he turned around, and he had this look on his face, and she said, you people come up here to mock us. And frankly, I, I didn't know how to react. In fact, I didn't say anything. And uh, he rambled on for a couple of minutes. Well, he was a Muslim. And in their eyes, if us, and he knew I was, obviously he could look at me and tell that I was an American or a Caucasian, you know, from some other part of the world. And I, I was just assuming that he knew or assumed that I was a Christian. So anyway, he rant and raved for just a couple of moments, and I just kind of avoided him and, and neglected uh, to say anything, and a couple of moments later, he walked away. But I am aware of the fact that Israel is a hated people today. Isn't that amazing? Now, they have a few allies, but they are indeed a hated people. I don't like to think about it, but us Christians are becoming a hated people also. So we have something in common with the Israeli people. And in this case, we are hated because we're Christ followers, and we are a threat to their religion. For some reason, they feel that they are threatened by us. And by all means, they should. Because if we pray for them, my friends, the skies can break through and change these people. And there are lots of them, I hear, coming to Christ. Hallelujah. Now, all the problems and the troubles are mounting. I don't have to tell you that. But we know the, the winds of time are shifting and it's not just bad weather, hail and tornadoes and hurricanes and all of that. The mood of the world is changing, and it is changing against God. Well, Jesus told us exactly what to look for. Chapter 24 of Matthew is a full description. Everything Jesus said is happening as we speak. And in fact, I don't hardly understand, and I wonder at times, how much more can God allow. Now, I say that often, and I'm sure many of you do. How much more can take place? I picked out a clipping not long ago, and I wanted to just read a little bit of it to you. I don't stand usually and read stuff. But the headline here, America is preparing the way for the coming world government. Now, folks, this thing is slipping in under our noses, as it were, this world government, globalism, there's a bunch of names you can hang on it. It is happening quickly. And some of the experts in the, the theological circle are saying, how long can we go before it is finalized? Some writers have questioned how America could relinquish her sovereignty and join the coming world government in light of the constitutional safeguards that were created by the Founding Fathers. However, since World War II, the U.S. Congress has passed a number of laws giving the President awesome executive powers. This is to enable him to safely control the government and military forces in the event of nuclear war. It is obvious that the President needs legal authority to direct and to control the resources of a nation to protect its citizens. Now, so far, so good. However, these executive orders 
are a loaded gun that a future president could use to legally establish a dictatorship to facilitate Americans joining a world government. Some have suggested that an emergency could be created in the future as an excuse to enact emergency legislation that Congress would never pass in normal times. The article goes on to say the range of dictatorial powers available to a president during a declared national emergency are equal to or greater than the legal powers held by Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin during their dictatorships. The legislation always allows a president to suspend the Constitution. Now, for those of us who studied American history, this should send shivers up our spines. A president who could suspend the Constitution and exercise these powers whenever he alone determines that the nation faces a national emergency, real or imagined, real or concocted. Do you follow me? The term national emergency is not defined by the laws in question. It is left solely to the president to determine when a national emergency exists and to exercise these draconian dictatorial pastor powers. Now, I, I don't uh, call myself an alarmist by any means. I know that God is on the throne. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God is on the throne. And we know that he has power over the whole thing. doesn't make any difference what a president would ever do. However, life could get tough if some president, whomever, should declare a national emergency for political purposes and bring an end to what America has always been overnight. Now, these are staggering and frightening things. And again, I don't share this with you to suggest that we need to wring our hands or jump off a cliff. I'm simply saying if there's ever a time that American Christians ought to be on their knees praying, it's now. Because there are things going on in D.C. Uh, frankly are frightening to the extent that we don't know from one day to the next what's going to happen next. I pray, Lord Jesus, come. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind telling you, I'm ready, I'm ready to go. I, I would just soon be out of here before midnight. May or might not happen that way. But here's another little short list of what that means. Seizure of all print and electronic communications media in the United States. Seizure means that it would all come under the control of one lone human being. That's frightening. Seizure of all electric power, fuels, minerals, public and private. Seizure of food supplies and resources, public, public and private, including farms and equipment. Seizure of all means of transportation, including cars, trucks, any other vehicles, including control over highways, harbors, and waterways. Seizure of all American people for workforces under federal supervision. It allows the government to split up families if they believe it is necessary. This has already happened in years gone by in another country. Seizure of all health, education, and welfare facilities, public and private. Registration by the Postmaster General of all men, women, and children for government services. Seizure of all airports and aircraft. Seizure of all housing and finance authorities. Authority to establish forced relocation. Designated areas that most must be abandoned as unsafe. This would be establishment of new locations for population groups, building of new housing on public land, seizure of all railroads, inland waterways, storage warehouse, public and private, 
and authorize the Office of Emergency Planning to put the above orders into effect in times of increased international tension or financial crisis. Now, the list is a little long. And forgive me for reading all of that, but I, I do feel tonight that we, uh, by nature, take a lot for granted. We have, been, we have been given so much in America, and we probably sometimes forget what it cost the early founding fathers to give us what we enjoy today. And so I don't want to be caught off guard under any circumstance. I hear things on the news that is frightening, and it has to do with what's going on in the higher levels of government. But it is safe to say that of all Bible truths, the first is the truth of eternal salvation for lost mankind. And I assure you tonight, friends, you and I, will be the only source of hope for a lost person if they're out and around and you're close enough to them to share it. You and I will be the ones to tell them how to get saved. And I want to be sure that my prayer life is up to speed. Who do you know? Let me just be personal. Who do you know? Possibly in your neighborhood, a neighbor, a friend, a family member. A business associate. Who do you know tonight if you feel reasonably sure that this person or persons are not born again? If you don't have a list, start one. Put their name at the top. If you have compassion, and I know you do, make it your business to pray for them and look for an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. It's that simple. I mean, you don't even have to have a high school diploma to do that. You don't have to have a Ph.D. to do that. Just tell them about Jesus. Best you know how. And the Holy Spirit will do the work. The Holy Spirit will bring up the rear end, so to speak. There's a second great truth. It is the promise of deliverance from the final seven years of judgment called the tribulation. Now, all the way back to Matthew 24 and First, uh, don't go back, but, but just hold on for a moment. But all the way back to what we just read a moment ago and what we read last Sunday evening in uh, 1 Thessalonians. And then in 2 Thessalonians, Paul spends more time talking to the same people about the promise of Christ's return. Now, if our freedoms suddenly went out the door, folks... America will never be the same. I mean, that's just what it boils down to. America will never be the same again if we should lose our freedoms. If martial law should be enacted and it could happen overnight, everything is going to change. I can't tell you from experience because I don't know. However, I've read stories of what martial law is all about as it is designed or called for by someone whose, uh, whose motives are questionable. So what we're going to do as Christians is face the possibility as we have watched things develop as they have over the last two years. Actually, it's taken longer than that. But us Americans must be on the front lines of defense. Us Christians, we just need to be on the front lines. And so what we need to do, may I encourage you, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but plead with the Father that somehow we could be spared these horrors of all of these uh, legislative uh, uh, enactments should take place. Let's just pray that God will deliver us from this awesome power of the politic. If we pray to that end, I know that God will understand our hearts. You're going to protect your life, your wife, your husband, your children, your friends. And we're going to try to keep America in the middle of the road as long as we possibly can. But we need to pray like we've never prayed before. We just need to petition the throne of God every day. I spend a lot of time with this on my heart, asking God just to be merciful to us. Now, Paul said to the people in 
2 Thessalonians. So if you want to just flip on over to that one, it's easy to find. And uh, chapter 2, Paul is saying now, he's talking to the brethren. They were worried about another form of this same anarchy. It was ungodliness from one side of the road to the other. The Christians were hated. They were abused. Many of them lost their lives. But Paul is encouraging these people. So he said in chapter 2, verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, we beg you, we plead with you, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now he's talking about the return of Christ. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter or as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except. Now watch this. You've read it. Many of you could share it as good as I could. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Pause right there for just a moment. The falling away implies that the church, the body of Christ, will become so enamored with the world, so intrigued by the world, caught up by the world, that they, the church, the bride of Christ, would fall away, as it were, and become distracted by the world. There is a danger of that. We could spend a lot of time talking about the distractions that we face today. You know what I'm talking about. Everything is bidding for your time, your attention, your money, your interest. Somebody's going to knock on your door soon want to sell you something. Somebody's going to advertise. It doesn't make any difference what the media is or whatever. You're going to hear somebody trying to distract your attention away from the stuff that's going on. So, But Jesus said there could be a falling away, will be a falling away. Paul refers to this uh, following Matthew chapter 24. But don't be deceived, he said. That day shall not come. In other words, when it does, you will be able to identify it. So he talks about a falling away first. Shudder to think that the church would lose its power, lose its prayer power, and lose its position in the world as a leader. I want us to be strong, and I believe you do. And I want us to pave the way, not just for souls to be saved, but to keep the enemy at a distance. Amen. Keep the enemy at a distance. You see, he's not bigger than we are. He's not more powerful than we are. We can pray him out of business, locally, nationally. I don't know if it'll happen. I pray that it could. But Paul goes on to say that this falling away precedes or, let me just paraphrase a little and, and add a thought, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. It is the absence of God's power that opens the door to the enemy. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And so uh, Paul is just simply saying, we are the stopgap. We're the plug that will stop his engine. Uh, I don't know how far to go with that thought, but I do know that we're greater in power than the enemy. So he talks about the falling away, the man of sin being revealed. Verse 4 said, here's what he will be doing. He will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now we know that's the mid-trib event. That's going to happen three and a half years after the tribulation begins. Now I am a pre-trib rapture person. How about you? All right. I, there might be somebody say, well, no, I don't know. I'm not sure, Brother Jay. But friends, I believe that Matthew 24, 38 is the key to the whole thing. And you don't have to turn back. But Jesus said, here's what to look for just before I return. Now, it's not the, it's not the gloom and doom. He said, it will be like it was in the days of Noah before the judgment. You remember the story and the scripture. But G Jesus said they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and everything was normal to them for the most part. 
as much as you could expect it to be. Now, the days before Noah, it was bad because it was evil everywhere. But for the most part, it was normalcy. And so they were doing the things that we've done for the last 245 years. It was normal. But we're more normal than America's ever been because we just come and go, and we don't pay much attention to anything else unless it gets in our face. So Paul is simply saying that this thing is going to proceed to the advent or the entrance of the uh, Antichrist. And so he skips ahead. But what we've got to do is back up just a little bit to what Jesus said and remember that Paul reminded the church that before all that happens, there's going to be a time of just, it's ho-humness, if there's such a word. It's just business as usual. So Paul gets to the crux of the matter. And he says in verse 5, Do you not remember that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholds that he, the Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. This is where the pre-trib rapture uh, doctrine comes into play. And so I am thankful tonight that because of what Jesus said and what Paul reminds us of is that before the Antichrist shows up, Jesus will appear in the clouds of heaven, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and we that are alive and remain shall be caught up into the heavens to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. The only thing we don't know, I wish I did, maybe I shouldn't, but the only thing we don't know is the timetable. What if, what if things really get worse before Antichrist shows up and somebody in a high place in American politics declares a national emergency, martial law, and somebody pulls up in front of your house with a loudspeaker and says, do not leave your house. You are restricted. You are confined. You cannot leave without permission. That may never happen. I pray that it won't. But it could. Which is why we need to be on our knees before the Lord God. And the reason I say it in the fashion that I just did, there are places in the world today where Christians cannot come and go as we do. They are under orders to do what the government says. So we're just blessed. We can still come and go. And I want to be sure that we don't abuse our privileges. We can go on and on. We've been over these verses so many times through the years. But let's be reminded tonight, the ball is in our court, so to speak. Let's be about the business of praying for our nation. And I'm sure you have been praying for our nation, praying for the president, praying for the Congress, praying for the senators, praying for the churches that they will come alive with the power of God, praying that God will so indwell the preachers as they get in the pulpits that they will hardly be able to contain themselves for the excitement of what God is about to do. We need to get excited. What do you say? Well, let's do that as we stand, all right? <laughs> and as we pray tonight, let us be reminded that God said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We could quote verse after verse after verse. Let's thank him for each verse tonight. What do you say? Let's pray. And Father, we're grateful now for the written word, the spoken word. Thank you for the privilege to preach the gospel. Thank you for the honor we have to be in this fellowship tonight. I thank you so much for my brother Perry and Miss Debbie and ask even at this very moment that they might enjoy the sweet touch and presence of your Holy Spirit even greater than all through the previous hours of this day. Bless them, I beg. Well, thank you now for victory. Keep us alert and awake. In Jesus' name, and amen. And amen. God bless, friends. We will see you next time. Now, Brother Perry is planning to be with you on Sunday morning, so pray that he will be able to do that. Amen.